Hello everyone and welcome to today's Cambridge University Press ELT webinar. I'm Alastair Horn, and I'll be moderating today's session along with my colleague Simon Wright, both of us are from Cambridge University Press. And we're very pleased to welcome Jeanne and Helen as today's presenters. Jeanne McCartan taught English in Sweden, France, Malaysia and the UK before coming in, becoming an ELT writer and is interested in applying insights from corpus research to language teaching. Helen Sanderford has extensive teacher and teacher training experience, having spent nine years in Japan setting up English programs and teaching in Japanese senior high schools and vocational colleges. And of course, they're both authors of Touchstone and Viewpoint. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, Alistair. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's presentation, Conversation Strategies 101. Um, you may be able to guess from the title of the presentation uh, that today we're going to be talking about the basics of conversation strategies, what they are, how we can teach them, why we need to teach them, and answer those kinds of questions. So first of all, let's think about what is a conversation strategy. Well, basically, conversation strategies are techniques that we use to manage our conversations with other people. We use them in our own native languages, but it's really important to teach these conversation strategies uh, to students who are learning English. And that's for a couple of reasons. Most of the students we teach are not in an immersive English language environment. So they can't really intuit these strategies or pick them up naturally, or it's not easy to do that. So we have to create an environment where these strategies are overtly taught and practiced. And secondly, strategies are very important, these conversation strategies, because they can possibly help students become more fluent in English and they can become more accomplished as a speaker. Managing a conversation is a real skill. Um, it's really important that we can ask for favors politely, for example, or that we can avoid answering difficult questions if we choose to, um, or that we can get to a point more quickly and do so politely. Um, and these are skills that we can actively teach. And in many cases, as we'll see um, as we move through the presentation, it's not actually difficult to teach some of these conversation strategies because often they manifest themselves uh, through specific vocabulary or expressions and we can teach these very easily and overtly to our students. So let's have a look at some examples of strategies. Um, there are several different kinds of strategies that we use as speakers. There are strategies we use to manage conversations as a whole, uh, to make sure we're taking turns or to refer back to things people said earlier in a conversation, or for example, to try and end a conversation or to keep a conversation moving along. So these kinds of strategies manage the conversations as a whole. Another type of strategy that we use in conversation is to manage our own talk. For example, we might want to rephrase something that we said to make a meaning clearer. You know, maybe when we said something, we made a mistake and we need to correct what we said. Well, there are ways and strategies we use to do that. In the same way, maybe we don't want to sound too harsh and we want to soften something we say to someone. So, for example, it's potentially quite harsh and a little bit too direct to say to someone, you're insensitive. In an argument that would be accompanied by hurt feelings and floods of tears and possibly divorce, but it's potentially less confrontational to say, you know, you're being just a little, you know, kind of insensitive in a way. That's an example of a strategy for managing your own talk. There's a third kind of strategy that we use in conversation, and that's taking account of others. In this category, um, we might need to check what someone said. 
so we prompt them for a re-explanation. Or maybe the other person can't remember a word and we prompt them and help them to try and remember that word. Or we encourage someone to continue speaking. So basically, three kinds of strategies. So let's take a little quiz here and you're going to see some examples of these kinds of strategies. I'm going to present the strategy to you and I want you to figure out what kind of strategy it is. Is it managing the conversation as a whole? Is it managing your own talk? Or is it taking account of other people? Okay, so here's the first strategy. The strategy is asking questions in two ways to be clear and not too direct. So for example, we might say, what do you do for lunch? Do you like bring your own packed lunch? Sometimes if we ask a single question, it can sound a little overbearing, um, especially if we're asking question after question after question. It can begin to sound a little bit like an interview. So we can soften our questions by asking in, in two ways. As here, so it's not threatening to the other person. So what kind of strategy is this an example of? Is it managing the conversation as a whole, managing your own talk, or taking account of other people? Now we have to remember sometimes these strategies overlap a little bit. This one is actually an example of taking into account other people. Because the reason we're asking these questions in two ways is to take account of the other person. We don't want to be threatening to them. We don't want to be confrontational to them. So this is an example of taking account of other people. Congratulations to all the many of you who mentioned it was that strategy. Here's another one. Um, suggesting a word or a name using do you mean? And here's the example. Somebody's talking about something here. My sister has her hair in, um, what do you call those things? What, what do you call them? Speaker A obviously can't remember the word. And speaker B says, oh, do you mean cornrows? And I've given you a little example in the pictures there to show what kind of cornrows we're talking about. The ones on someone's head, not in a field. So my sister has her hair in, and what do you call them? Oh, do you mean cornrows? Now, is speaker B managing the conversation as a whole, managing his or her own talk, or taking account of other people? I'm just looking at some of the responses that you are sending in. Well done. This is taking into account other people again. Why? Because speaker B is taking account of the fact that the person can't remember the word and is helping them. And they're doing that with the expression, do you mean? Here's one more. Here's a strategy where you make a comment and then ask a question to keep a conversation going. So for example, have you been to that new club? No, but I've heard good things about it. How was it? What is that an example of? Is that managing a conversation as a whole? Managing your own talk? Or taking account of other people? Katerina, Mohammed, I see you said managing a conversation as a whole. That is correct. The speaker is making a comment and asking a question in order to keep the conversation going. So it's a strategy to manage the conversation as a whole. Here's the final one. The strategy here is repeating ideas to make your meaning clear. So for example, speaker A says, I often have weird dreams, like really weird dreams. I mean, just off the wall. And speaker B goes, yeah. What is speaker A doing here? Is speaker A managing the conversation as a whole? Managing his or her own talk? Or taking account of other people? You guys are getting really good at this. This is an example of managing your own talk by repeating ideas 
to make that your make sure your meaning is clear. And you'll see that the speaker repeats in a couple of ways. One, by repeating the word weird and then repeating off the wall, which also means weird or unusual. So if you've got four out of four here, you're well on your way to passing Conversation Strategies 101. Let's move along and think about how strategies are realized. It's one thing to say to students, you know what, when you're having a conversation, you need to end it politely, or you should really learn how to soften what you say. But the question is, how do we actually do this? You know, or for example, if we want to keep a conversation moving along so it doesn't grind to a halt, but how do you do that? So what we're going to do now is look at some ways that strategies are actually realized. And basically, strategies can be realized in one of three ways. Through vocabulary, through a technique of sorts, or through grammar. And we're going to look at each of these in turn. So some strategies are realized through vocabulary. And in this particular instance, it can be a single word item such as well. What do we use well for? It's very common, it's very useful, but when do we use it? Well, we use it in a couple of different ways. The first way is when we don't want to answer a question with a simple yes or no. That's a strategy, being able to answer a question without using a simple yes or no answer. So for example, where are you from? I'm from Tokyo. Obviously I'm not, I'm just giving an example there. But that's great if you're from Tokyo and you live in Tokyo and your answer is very straightforward. However, if your background's a little bit more complex and you need to be able to give a more complex answer, it's not so easy to just give the answer. You have to use a strategy, a technique, a word. In here, the word well. So for example, if someone asks me, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Manchester in England. That doesn't actually tell you that I was born there, but I've not lived there for three decades. And actually now I live in Utah in the US. So my answer would be better purposed as, well, I'm from Manchester originally, but I live in the US now. The use of well in that answer is very important. It signals that my answer is not straightforward, that it's a little bit more complex, that I'm not giving you a straight yes or no answer. Are you from Manchester? Well, I'm from Manchester originally, but actually now I live in the US. We also use well when we need more time to think. What do you want for dinner? Well, how about some sushi or maybe we should just have a salad or something. In that particular instance, the strategy is taking time to think. And the strategy manifests itself through this piece of vocabulary, the word well. And it gives you time to think. What do you want for dinner? Hmm, well, how about some sushi? That well gives you time to think. It's a great strategy to teach students, especially at lower levels. And Jeanne will be talking about that, about that uh, more in detail later. We can also use well for another strategy. When you're waiting for an answer from someone, you can actually prompt them with the word well. What do you want for dinner? Hmm. Well, what do you want? In that instant, well means, have you decided? What's your answer? I'm prompting the speaker to tell me what he or she wants for dinner. It has to be used carefully in that particular context. Um, well can sound a little rude in that situation if you don't use it carefully. But what we have here is one little word, well, which is one of the top 50 words. It's a very frequent word. And three completely different strategies. Strategies can also be realized uh, through vocabulary 
and a particular set of expressions as here. Here's a set of expressions. I'd better go. I've got to get going. I'm going to have to run. Can I call you back? I'll call you later. I've really got to go. So this particular set of expressions is used to realize a strategy. And the strategy here is, anyone like to guess? What would the strategy be here? Anybody like to guess what the strategy would be here? If I use the expression, I'd better go, I've got to get going, I'm gonna have to run, can I call you back? I'll call you later, I've really got to go. What would that strategy be? I'm gonna wait for a couple of seconds while you have chance. I can see many of you are furiously typing here to get some answers up. Mar Marcello, thank you, ending a conversation. The strategy is a way of ending a conversation politely, but it's a particular kind of conversation. And the clue there is, can I call you back? I'll call you later. So it's ending a phone conversation. And you'll see here, this is an example from um, actual textbook material where we teach this strategy. That what we do is we have students look at the conversation where these expressions are used. Here in this conversation, you'll see a photo of Ramon. He's lingering on the phone. Ling, the lady in the presentation there, is longing to get off the phone because Ling has to get along to a seminar. So Ling is using all of these expressions. I better go, I've got to get going. Can I call you back? But Ramon doesn't give up. He keeps trying and trying to continue the conversation. And Ling is trying politely to end the phone conversation. So here's a simple activity. What we do after we've presented the conversation in class, you'll see a little notice box there that says, notice how Ling tries to end the phone conversation with expressions like these. Find examples in the conversation. One thing we can do, a very simple activity for the classroom, is have two students, as you know, read out the conversation. But each time, have them notice when these expressions are used. So we're going to try that. I'd like you all at home or wherever you are, when you hear one of these expressions used, please raise your hand, okay? Listen carefully and when you hear, I'd better go or I've got to get going, raise your hand. Hi Ling, it's Ramon. It's a, is this a good time to talk? Uh, not really, I'm late for a seminar. I'm going to have to run. Did everybody raise their hand? Good, okay. Okay, I just wanted to ask about this weekend. Well, can I call you back tonight? I've got to get going. Okay, some of you didn't raise your hand for that first one. Can I call you back tonight? I've got to get going. Okay, I'll be home after eight. I'm going to go to the gym after work. Oh, good. I'll call you later. I better go now. Raise your hand. Yeah, so think about what you want to do on Sunday. Yeah, I will. Listen, Ramon, I've really got to go. I'm already late. Did you raise your hand for I've really got to go? That was one of the expressions. All right, I'll let you go. By the way, what's your seminar about? Being assertive. Bye now. Oh, okay. Talk to you later. Okay. So simply having students raise their hand is one way of getting them to notice when these expressions are being used for this particular strategy. Here's another example of a strategy that's realized through vocabulary. This time it's a fixed chunk or expression. And um, those of you who know um, the work of Professor Michael McCarthy, one of our co-authors, you'll be very familiar with chunks. A chunk is a fixed piece of language. Um, if you want to know more about chunks of language, by all means, uh, look up his work. It's fascinating stuff. Here the chunk or the expression is that would be. And here it's used to comment on suggestions and possibilities. So for example, you might want to go there and meet some of the professors. She's making a suggestion. And he says, that'd be good. I might go to Bracken next year. Really, that would be awesome. So the strategy here is commenting on suggestions and possibilities. And the strategy is realized 
through the expression that would be plus an adjective. Here you can see the most frequent expressions used with that would be, and they are that would be nice, that would be good, that would be great, fun, cool, interesting, fine, wonderful, neat, hard, and awesome. Here are a couple of fun activities that you can do with your students in the classroom. One thing you can do is um, use photos to prompt a conversation like this one here. And students might come up with a conversation like this. You know, um, we should go skydiving sometime. Oh my gosh, that would be. And then students insert their own adjective. Oh my gosh, that would be awesome. That would be fun. Or in my case, oh my gosh, that would be an absolute nightmare. <laughs> I can't imagine I'd want to go skydiving. Alternatively, you can give a response to students, for example, that would be interesting, and have students brainstorm ideas and think of what someone could say to elicit that response. So for example, that would be interesting. What could you say to get that kind of response? Maybe, how about we go to that new exhibition at the museum? That would be interesting. Or how about we listen to Jeanne and Helen's next webinar? Yeah, that would be interesting. Or, and you can see how that works. Students think of a sentence that would fit with a response that you give them. Let's move along. How else are strategies realized? They realize through a particular technique. For example, here, the strategy is showing that you are interested in someone's news. Let's read the notice box together. It says, notice how Jessica answers Tom's question and then asks a similar one. She shows she's interested in Tom's news too. Find her question in the conversation. Let's find it. Jessica answers Tom's question and then asks a similar one. So Tom asks, so how was your weekend, Jessica? Great, Gina and I went biking out in the country. Really? Yeah, it was fun. But there were lots of hills. I was exhausted by the end of the day. Yeah, I bet. So anyway, what did you do? Oh, I had a party Saturday. It was good. That's where Jessica answers the question and then asks a similar question. She says, so anyway, what did you do? How was your weekend? What did you do? So that's the technique. The strategy is not realized through a particular item of vocabulary there. It's a technique where you answer a question and then ask a similar one. A great technique to teach students to help them show interest in a conversation and keep a conversation going. Strategies are also realized through grammar. Here's an example of showing interest and this keeps the conversation moving along also. You can show interest by responding with short questions like do you and have you. Use the same tense as the other person. So I've seen it a couple of times. He's talking about a movie here. I've seen it a couple of times. Have you? The speaker be there is responding with a short question and showing interest in what the first person has just said. In this instance, you can see that because um, the strategy is realized by using a short question that is in the same tense as the speaker A is using, that this uh, requires some manipulation of grammar. So this strategy is realized um, through grammar, through ex uh, expressions and questions that have a grammatical component. Let's look at the first example. I've never been up in a hot air balloon. I'm afraid of heights. What would speaker B say there? How does speaker B show interest? What is the short question that speaker B would use? Sheila, thank you. Are you? Me too. I hate flying. So I've never been up in a hot air balloon. I'm afraid of heights. Are you? Me too. I hate flying. What's the next question? I hate flying. Do you? 
all of you had that. Fabulous. So you have to use the same tense as the other person. Clearly, there's a grammatical component. I'm going to finish up my section of the presentation here with one more slide. Here's a little activity you can take straight to your classroom with students. Have the uh, short response questions on your whiteboard or on the board somewhere. And then simply say a sentence about yourself and have everybody in the class respond. Very simple way to practice. It's quite fun. I live in Utah in the US. What's the response? Do you or you do? Perfect. I've been here for 15 years. You have? Have you? You guys are good. I moved here from Cambridge in England. I moved here from Cambridge in England. Did you? You did? Very good. That's where Jeanne, my co-author, lives. She does, does she? Very good. And that's who I'm going to hand over to right now. <laughs> Thank you, you Helen. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. You are? <laughs> OK, thanks very much um, for, for that, Helen. Um, I'm going to talk now about um, some of the factors that we use in grading these strategies. Um, some of you have been asking questions about what levels the material that we're looking at are at. And <clears throat> I want to um, perhaps answer that for ev everyone. Helen has been showing examples from the very first level, level one of Touchstone, and then also level three. So from beginner level to low intermediate going into e intermediate levels. And the questions are very timely because I'm going to talk about how you can grade what strategies you teach at what levels. And we can use various factors. First of all, frequency. How frequent is the strategy? Helen showed you the example of well. And well is an example of a word that's always in the top. 30 or 40 words of any spoken corpus. It's more frequent than many of the most common grammar words like conjunctions and so on. So it's obviously a word that is, is frequent and therefore worth teaching at quite an elementary level. Secondly is how relevant is this strategy to students at this level. One of the things Helen said about well is that it gives you time to think if someone asks you a question. And what do elementary learners of a language need more than anything else when someone asks them a question? It's time to think of an answer, isn't it? We all have the experience of panicking when we're asked questions because we have to think of the answer and how, how to say it. So well is a very handy little tool that you can use to show someone you're going to speak but you haven't quite got your answer ready. Thirdly is complexity. How complex is the language that students need in order to use this strategy? So at an intermediate, upper intermediate level, you might want to teach students how to ask questions politely using phrases like, I was wondering if you could help me. That's quite a complex structure. We have the past continuous, we have if, and then we have this embedded question, I was wondering if you could help me. So there's no point in teaching a strategy like that until students have learnt the formal structural elements of that until they know the grammar. So we can't ask students to perform a strategy which requires language which is above the level that, that they're at. 
And related to that is how easy is the strategy to explain? Is it teachable? Um, and the other side of that coin is how learnable is it? Um, how easy is it for students to remember? And also, how easy is it to practice? So going back to well again, it's very easy for students to understand well can give them time to think, or that well is a good way of starting uh, an answer to a question that doesn't have a simple answer. So we have to make sure that we're not overloading students with complex linguistic terminology. Another factor as we go up the levels is to take into account how much students are expected to say, the extent of, of what they say. And we're going to look at some examples here. As students go up the levels, we can expect them to have longer terms in a conversation, to, to hold the floor for, for longer. And finally, what kinds of conversations will students engage in, perhaps at lower levels, we're helping them to engage in simple, casual conversation. But as students go up the levels, they're learning English for different purposes. So what kinds of strategies do they need there? So I want to look at some examples of, of strategies at different, different levels. So the first factor that we uh, look, <coughs> I want to look at is the notion of complexity of language and teachability and learnability. So at the very basic levels, we might have a very simply defined broad strategy. And the example I've chosen is to use I mean to repeat your ideas or to say more about something. And you realize this strategy you can realize the strategy with just the expression, I mean. So you choose an item like that um, to, 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 to teach a broader strategy. So here we have an example. These two, this is an extract from a conversation at elementary level. And students learn that you can use I mean to repeat your ideas or to say more about something. And Adam there uses I mean to join two questions. Where do you go? I mean, do you go somewhere nice? He's asking her about where she goes for dinner after class. And Elise says, do you know Fabio's? It's okay. I mean, the food's good. And she carries on. And she uses I mean to join two statements, to, to construct her turn. And we learn here that I mean is one of the top 15 expressions. It's actually the third most common two-word expression after you know and I think. So it's a very, very frequent expression. And it's very useful, especially for elementary students, because they can use I mean to put together what they want to say and to add to what they, they say. And it helps them to keep the floor, to keep their turn in the conversation. So after this has been presented and, and students have looked for the expression I mean in the conversation, we can go on to practice it in very, very simple conversational exchanges like the A activity here. Complete the conversations with sentences from the box, write A to F. So number one, do you ever go out on weeknights? Well, not very often. What do you think comes next? OK, some people are really quick off the mark. B, well, not very often. I mean, I often go to bed early during the week. How about number two? How do you like the restaurants around here? What's the next one that comes up? That's right, E. I mean, are they good? And B replies, they're okay. 
And the next one would be C. Yes, everyone, everyone's typing in the correct, the correct letters. So what students are doing here, they're doing a, a simple matching. And in doing that, they're recycling all the simple present questions and statement forms that um, you've taught them and things like adverbs like on weeknights. So they're recycling the language. But they're doing this building towards building a conversation, being able to ask questions in two ways so that they're not too direct, which Helen mentioned earlier, and to construct a longer answer than just they're OK, they're good. So it's helping students to develop fluency and to extend what they say. And then students can listen to this to check their answers. So this is more practice in listening, and you can have them repeat these if, if you want to do that. But then after the activity, we have B about you pair work. And here, first of all, students practice the conversation. So they just get a chance to articulate those little exchanges that we've given them, which gives them warm-up practice of, of speaking, if you like. But then the important part is the about you element. It says, then practice again, giving your own answers, use I mean. So... I'm going to do this with you now. So I'm going to ask you, you all, do you ever go out on weeknights? And I want you, I want you to type your reply and use "I mean" while I have a sip of water. Do you ever go out on weeknights? Good. Sheila's getting first prize for getting straight in. You must be a very fast typer. Yes. Well, someone, someone's actually recycling the last strategy. Well, sometimes. I mean, I don't have much time. So, not much. I mean, I normally work in the evenings. Well, no, I mean, I like... I like sleeping early. I like going to bed early. So you see, you see the idea. And students can do this at quite a, a low level. So that's our basic strategy. At a higher level, we might want to focus on one aspect of that strategy of repeating ideas or saying more. Talk about clarification. And we might want to add to the repertoire of items. So instead of just teaching I mean, teach them other similar expressions like I don't mean, what I'm saying is, what I mean is, in other words, I'm just saying, I'm not saying, and so on. So it's the same basic strategy, but we've more narrowly defined it to say you can use these expressions to clarify your meaning or to make your your meaning clear. And we can do the same kind of practice at a higher level. The next thing is, how much are we expecting students to say? And some strategies are better for um, students who are at elementary levels who say just a little. But some strategies are good when students are actually saying quite a lot. And I want to show you an example of that. So a basic strategy might be helping students to tell an anecdote simply relating the main events or key events in a story. But as you progress as a, a learner and you tell anecdotes, you often want to do things that we all do when we're telling stories. You want to digress. You go off at a tangent. You you leave your main story and you add a comment or an extra detail or a reflection 
So you go away from the main storyline and then come back to it. And this is quite a high level strategy, um, which re requires some careful preparation and practice because the talk is more extensive. We want students to say more. Here are two people looking at some old school photographs, Arnold and, and Brad. And Brad is telling Arnold a story about a day, a picture day at school when all students had their photographs taken. I'm going to blow, blow this up. So Arnold says, look at this old class photo. I mean, look at our hair. Brad says, I know you should see one of my school photos. We'd forgotten it was picture day. And so he starts his, his anecdote and then the whole of the next part is he remembers something. He digresses from the main story. Looking back, picture day was a big deal in our house. My mum showed the photos to everybody and sent them out to my aunt. I hated it. Arnold says, no wonder. Brad said, yeah, and she made me wear a shirt and tights. No wonder I hated it. Then he comes back to his story. But anyway, back to my story. So he continues telling his story again. But then he digresses. I mean, when I think about it, I was always really scruffy looking. Yeah, me too. I didn't care how I looked back then. No, me neither. He comes back to his story. So anyway, where was I? And Arnold reminds him. So this is something we can encourage students to notice, even at the upper levels, to give them the language to do this. And we can have some controlled practice of it. Again, students, it is a very familiar te technique in materials where you put a missing expression into um, an anecdote. But it's different from a grammar, a piece of grammar or a piece of vocabulary. It's part of a, a strategy. And only one of those items fits in each gap and then students can practice. Now we want students to be able to tell anecdotes themselves but it's very difficult in class to do that. You have to think of an idea, you have to think of the details, you have to think of how to say it in English. So when it comes to freer practice it's a good idea to allow students some preparation or thinking time. Even if it's overnight and they do this for homework and come back to class the next day. And this is a technique you can use where students jot down their ideas in a chart. So in one part of the chart, they note down the main storyline. And then in the other part of the chart, they add a comment or a reflection or a small digression which they can insert. And so they can prepare to tell a longer anecdote. As students go up the levels, they need to be able to participate perhaps in academic conversations, in an academic setting, maybe seminars, conversations with um, other students or teachers. Or they need to go into professional settings, the workplace, and use English there. So, we have to prepare students for a wide range of exercise types, uh, sorry, of conversation types. And one of them is discussion. And within discussion, there are several advanced strategies that we can teach at that level. In academic settings, we often have to develop an argument um, or a case for something, and expressions that you can use for developing an argument, making a point, are things like, let's put it this way, let me put it another way, in that case, if so, and so on. Very often, we have to consider opposing or contrasting views. So you might say, this is a good idea, but having said that, it would be expensive. You, you, you can contrast one idea with another and you can use expressions like having said that or though 
And of course, one of the strategies, strategy areas which we haven't talked about today, and it's a whole huge area of, of conversation strategy teaching, is about responding, different kinds of responses. And in discussions, we might want um, to ask someone to say more about a point they make. So we can say, in what way? Um, it's difficult to do that. In what way is it difficult? In what way? Or we might want to agree and say that, that that's true with expressions like that's true, no doubt, and so on. So within, within the area of discussion as a, as a conversation type, there are lots and lots of different strategy types that are useful to, to um, help students uh, be successful communicators. Right. We're going to wrap up um, now with a, with a very quick summary. And, uh, and you can type in your, your questions along the way. Um, we feel that conversation strategies are vital to successful communication. You can't actually communicate without them. We use them all the time. Whatever language we're speaking, whatever we're doing. When we're involved in, in conversations with other people or discussions, we're always employing strategies all the time. But students need to learn how to do them in English. They may do some of them in their own language. Some students are better in their own language at, at employing conversation strategies than others. But all students need to learn how to do them in English. And this isn't something that just English speakers do. It's something we all do. We believe that they can be taught from the very early levels, from A1 right up to C2 and, and beyond. And by using them, they can transform other people's perception of students' fluency. They make students sound fluent because they enable them to be successful communicators. So we're going to stop presenting now and just say thank you very much for listening. And we'll take your, your questions. Thank you very much for listening and participating. Okay, thank you very much, Helen and Jan. That's that's wonderful. And um, we've got some questions coming in already. Um, a question from Pip Old, who says, um, there are so many uh, different conversation strategies to teach. How would you suggest organizing them into categories? Or do you have a sort of any ideas for fitting them into a syllabus or order or grouping for teaching right. them? Um, shall I take that, Helen? Sure, if you like to. Go yeah. ahead. Um, what, what we have done is we've, we've organized them into um, four main uh, um, syllabus areas, if you like. So our conversation strategy syllabus is based around four different um, cornerstones, if you like. Helen talked about three of them at the beginning, which is managing the conversation as a whole managing your own talk, taking account of other people. And then I mentioned briefly towards the end the notion of responding, or what we call listenership, which is the notion that you respond to what someone else says to show that you have understood what they, they say. So those are the four category areas that that we group our strategies into. And then we, grade, we graded them according to those factors that, that I showed. As you say, there are so very, very many. And it's impossible to teach every last one. But what we hope is that by using these, by teaching these strategies and encouraging them to encouraging students to notice them, and by making students aware of what strategies are, we develop their ability not just to learn the things that we're teaching them, but 
to go when they're using English in the real world outside of the classroom they've got the skills of noticing when other people are using different strategies so we're we're teaching them to become independent learners of strategies and and to help them to notice and learn outside and beyond the classroom okay thanks Jan, can i just oh, sorry. can i just add to that um I think one other thing that's really important when we're teaching conversation strategies is, as Jean said, that there are so, so many, and it's important that we make these manageable and um, accessible. So in our syllabus and material, in each unit, we have a, a lesson that's dedicated to conversation strategies. And within that lesson, we focus on a main strategy and then something we call a strategy plus, which is an additional strategy that's linked to the main strategy often or, or, or is something that uh, is connected but we we try to keep these manageable we try to keep focus on one main strategy and a supplemental strategy so students are not overwhelmed um, because I think it could be especially at the lower levels it could be overwhelming but I think we've been very careful in making sure we've graded the strategies and kept them into manageable um, chunks so that they are approachable for students. Okay, thanks. Um, question now from, um, sorry, just a minute, from Shiba Jojo, who asks about um, using conversational strategies in, in writing as well for students, or using something similar. How, what, what crossover is there between sort of using these sorts of strategies in, um, in writing, or is that not really applicable? Um, I think it's a very, it's a very good question because um, I think that there has often been a, a tendency in materials to think of English as one thing and one of the things that comes out of using um, a corpus or large databases of, of language that that we're able to use is that you have have to look at different types of English or different types of language and teach that kind of language within that kind of setting. So in the conversation lesson, you teach conversational language. In the writing lesson, you teach written language. Now writing has its own um, strategies, but they're not, obviously not conversation strategies because it's writing, not conversation. But um, Writing is organized in one way and conversation is organized or proceeds in, in other ways. And there is, there is some crossover because there are different kinds of writing. Some writing is more chatty and conversational. Um, and for example, emails to friends are very chatty and conversational. Essays for final year examinations at university are not chatty, they're more formal. So you have to teach according to the kind of, la teach the language according to the kind of genre or context that students um, need to produce. I, I don't know if that answers the question. Okay, thanks. I, I, I think so. Thank you very much. Um, question now from Magdalena Duda. <laughs> I've just read it. <laughs> okay, so I'll just read it for, for the audience. Um, so how do you approach correcting students while they're doing speaking activities? I know this is a question that comes up quite a lot um, in our webinars. It's always interesting to, to hear different answers to it. Um, so it's easy during controlled practice, but how about during free practice? Because um, it can be quite an interruption to students who are trying to be fluent and... Uh, Free. Shall I start this one off, Shan? Yes, go ahead, yeah. Sure. Um, I think teachers have, um, obviously, every teacher has their own, his or her own personal way of teaching and, and different style. Um, my personal approach when I'm in the classroom with students um, is actually to do as you as suggest, Magdalena, and make opportunity during the control practice um, to make sure students are, are responding correctly or using the strategy correctly um, and take that opportunity to correct. And then you'll remember when Jeanne was presenting, we, we in our material, present 
a second follow-up activity that's an about you where students have a chance to personalize and to free talk um, in a more open way. I personally feel that isn't the moment to correct students. I think it can be very de demotivating. Um, and it, as you have uh, suggested, it interrupts the flow of any conversation they're having. And the point of those free talk activities is for an opportunity for students to really communicate. And um, that's not the moment where we're fo focusing on um, whether students are uh, pronouncing words correctly or whether they're using the correct grammar or indeed whether they're uh, using the strategy correctly. Um, I think as a teacher, what we can do is observe what students are doing during those free or talk activities, um, make notes about it. And then if there are um, errors that are being frequently used, we go back and reteach. But I would concur with you, Magdalena, that isn't the moment to, to be correcting errors. I agree, yeah. Okay, thanks. Question now from Salim and Shuri, who asks, um, how do you overcome the problem of students being very passive during class activities? Yes, the quiet ones in the corner who don't speak. <laughs> shall, I, shall I start on this ahead. one, Yep, yep. Because I, I love this, um, this uh, anecdote that we have. When Jeanne and I were uh, visiting Mexico, we were very fortunate to uh, be able to visit the same classroom um, on, on an initial occasion and then on a follow-up occasion. And it was a fabulous experience because there were a lot of students in the classroom who were very uh, passive in the sense that um, they were afraid to speak out. They were beginner level students. They didn't know what to say. They didn't really want to, uh, to communicate in the class as such. And we observed the teacher teaching the strategy of well, um, using it for time to think. And the teacher taught the strategy, and the students all nodded their head, and everybody went home. And then a week later, we were in that same, very same classroom. And the teacher started the class as he always did, by saying, how was your weekend? And as we'd observed on the first occasion, all the students immediately looked down at their books. Nobody wanted to say anything. However, on this second occasion, after students had been taught this strategy, of taking time to think, um, one of the students, who was extremely shy, actually looked up and said, well, and then he paused, and then everybody else looked around, and there was some slight amusement, and he said, I, I had a good weekend. And it was great to see, because a class that had been previously passive, by giving them a simple strategy, to manage their own talk there and to give them time to think by using well, um, had suddenly felt more confident and more engaged with the class. And we've actually seen that happen, and it's been uh, great. So I think by teaching strategies, we're giving students tools and techniques um, to be more confident in speaking English and to be more engaged. Um, and to be less resistant to, to speaking out in the classroom. So I think actually teaching strategies helps with this particular um, issue of passivity in the classroom. If I can just add to, add to that as well, and um, one of the things we've tried very hard hard to do in our materials is um, exemplified in that little uh, exercise I showed you with I mean, with very simple easy to answer questions and answers and you build up from identifying what fits in each conversation giving students the opportunity to listen giving students the opportunity to practice the language that we provide them with other people's language giving them ideas of what they can say in that situation so you build up before they have to do it for themselves. And then the questions that are asked are very, very easy. So it, it helps them to overcome that passivity of not knowing what, what to say or what to do, because we're not asking them to um, come up with an answer to world peace or to expound their view about a very difficult moral issue. We're asking them very simple everyday questions 
which they can easily answer. There's a question there about global English, <laughs> um, which I'm very happy to answer, Alistair, if we have time. Um, yes, if we, um, yeah, we can just fit in a little bit, uh, one more question, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think um, English is, is used as a, as, a, as a global language, and I think that's a great um, thing because, you know, it means that the more we can communicate, the better we all are. Is communicability more important than the correct use of language? I think it, it depends. I mean, sometimes communicability may break down because students have don't have the correct use of language. But I think, it, you know, it depends what degree of accuracy we're talking about. I think the important thing for all learners is to be able to learn to the level that they need to communicate so that they are un understood. And I don't think it's a trade-off between accuracy and communicability. I think um, it's all part of, of the same thing. Occasionally, it doesn't matter if you get a preposition wrong or if you don't put the S on um, third person simple present verbs. But there are other issues about how you communicate with people and being able to maintain good relations with them by using these conversation strategies that are equally important. Okay, thanks. Just one, just fitting one quick, uh, very final question um, from Yazin Karatay, who says, um, there's great focus on communication in, in the Touchstone books. How do you think Touchstone balances the other skills, particularly in the context of the CEFR? I think Touchstone um, has a very good balance of all skills. Um, we teach, um, we do a, lo a lot of listening and uh, as, as well as, as speaking, we have a reading lesson in every um, unit two which develops reading skills and strategies in in um, in the second edition in a much more overt way perhaps than the first edition they, they're all there in in the first edition but um, not so overt but perhaps so I think I think we give um, a good all-round um, balance of skills I think in some ways, Jan, mm -hmm. oh sorry, Go ahead. I was going to say, I think, I think in some ways we are a five skills course um, that we go beyond what most four skill textbooks do because we have this additional strand in the syllabus of conversation strategies. So we teach all the four skills in addition to uh, the conversation strategies. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks very much. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. So thank you very much, Helen. Thanks, Shan, for an excellent webinar, as ever. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your questions and for your attention. I've just posted into the chat the fact that um, you can see recordings of all our webinars on our YouTube channel, and we'll post some highlights and recordings as well on our, on our blog. There's also our Facebook page and on Twitter where you can find out more about what we're doing. So next week at the earlier time of 10 o'clock UK times, so that's five hours early, earlier, um, Craig Thane will be joining us to explore how teachers' informal, instinctive, and ongoing evaluation of learners' progress can feed into a more formal assessment process. Um, on October the 28th, Caroline Nixon and Michael Tomlinson are talking about some fun activities for improving young learners' conversation skills. Um, on November the 4th, Lynn Durrant will be offering ideas for creating a stimulating pre-literacy classroom. On the 11th, Ben Goldstein and Paul Driver will be talking about integrating video into the class. On November the 18th, we're looking at using images to stimulate learner engagement. And on the 25th, um, Gilly Cunningham will be offering some practical and fun ideas to help students revise and retain language. So thank you very much. You can sign up for all of those via our website, um, www.cambridge.org. Um, and I'll just type into the chat the URL for actually um, signing up to our webinars. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks particularly to, to you both, Helen and Jan. And um, we'll thank see you, you all in a few weeks, I hope, in, in one week's you, time. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye.